Okay, thank you so much. Am I audible? Is the microphone working? I think so. Cool, all right, welcome everyone. So I have prepared, I think about 62 slides, or maybe even more than that, quite a few. So, um, and we are of course running short on time, so I might skip over some of the details, but I wanted to take you on a journey from the simplest to kind of the more advanced machine learning algorithms, but we'll see how far we get. Let's just take it as it comes. And before I really jump into it, perhaps a disclaimer is in order. This lecture is intended for people who do not have much experience or maybe even no experience whatsoever in uh, machine learning. So I will be talking about very, very, very basic things here. So in case you are already an expert um, and you came here just to support me, uh, you know, because you like me, that's cool, but you're welcome to leave and attend another talk. I will not take offense. But otherwise, if you would like to learn more about basics, Hopefully, hopefully, uh, oh great, Stacy wants me to be more interactive online. So, um, we'll talk about basic terminology, we'll talk about some of the most important, I guess, paradigms in ML, important algorithms, what you will definitely not learn about. Um, and if we get there, I'll hope to give you a gentle introduction to neural nets. I have been teaching neural nets maybe for the past 10 years of my life. Uh, I, I think I can pitch it at the right level here, but we shall see what you will definitely not learn about. Um, and I'm sorry to disappoint anyone who came for exactly that. I'm not going to teach you to code in TensorFlow. In my opinion, these days, there are many more people who can code a neural network without understanding it, rather than those who understand the neural network but cannot code it. Modern tools make coding a neural network so simple that a first year student comes into my class and says, ma'am, I was trying to code the convolutional neural network and it's kind of working, but it's giving me some errors. I'm like, yeah, you probably just use a keras, couple of keras layers, haven't you? So um, the idea of this talk is rather to give you intuitions than to give you code recipes, because I think code recipes you can look up online. Then another thing I did see on the forum, some of you have indicated that you are interested in the basics of neural networks, such as how does backpropagation work? And yes, backpropagation is important. And we will actually touch on some of the mathematics, but again, we are not going to derive it. We're not going to be doing partial uh, derivatives and stuff like that, because unfortunately there is just no time for all of that. But hopefully again, I'll give you enough background to go and study this on your own if you wish. And without further ado, let's jump straight into it. So we want to talk about basics of machine learning, but before we go into the definitions, maybe we should start with kind of the biggest umbrella term of them all, machine learning. What exactly is machine learning? What what do we mean when we say that? Is it perhaps another name for artificial intelligence? Well, in my opinion, yes, it is. The two are actually quite similar. Um, machine learning is basically, I guess, the means by which we hope to achieve artificial intelligence. But again, all these things are somewhat philosophical and one might even say hand wavy. Maybe we should take an even further step back and try to define intelligence itself. So if we want to create artificial intelligence, obviously we have some notion of what intelligence means. So in your opinion, what is it exactly that we are trying to model when we say we are trying to model intelligence? Any takers? Great, well, because, yeah, I do, I do see. Ability to learn, yes. Sorry? Human brain. Well, I think, don't you think uh, cats and dogs are also intelligent? I think they are, you know, like, yeah, sure, human maybe has like a superior intelligence, but like simply intelligence, a cat can also like learn and do things. In my opinion, intelligence, first of all, we shouldn't be so self-entitled to think that we are the only ones possessing intelligence. Lots of things around us have intelligence and we should definitely recognize that. But yeah, the ability to learn is definitely uh, Right there, this is a textbook definition that I looked up for this lecture. If you ask a dictionary, um, the dictionary will tell you that intelligence is the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. In other words, the ability to learn. And if you look up the, in, the definition of learning itself, learning actually seems to have the very, very same keywords there. Learning is the acquisition of knowledge or skills through study experience or being taught. So basically, learning and intelligence for sure are very much related to one another and because of that i feel that we can safely state that machine learning is indeed 
our means of arriving at intelligence that is artificial. In other words, that didn't grow from a biological cell, but rather was created by us with, you know, our artificial human means. Great. So again, to uh, I guess drive the point home, how do we learn as humans? So if we want to model learning, we obviously need to figure out how learning actually happens with human beings and you know other mammals and maybe even non-mammals, other other biological beings that possess intelligence. And well, at least with humans, and I think that's applies to animals to some extent as well. We may, mainly learn from two sources. One is obviously our direct interaction with the environment. So just the raw data, just the signals that you receive, you touch, you feel, you see and you learn from that. But data is not really the only source of knowledge, right? That can develop over time. And other important source is information. And that essentially is some meaningful representation of the data. We as human beings, and I think this is really where our superior edge comes in, have language. And language is an amazing compressed representation that you can describe the data with and pass it on to other people. You can describe an apple to somebody who has never seen an apple. And sure, it's not the same as actually tasting an apple, but they'll get an idea, right? So information is um, some kind of a useful representation of data. And we as humans, and I guess other creatures as well, learn from both of these things. And then finally, what exactly is the aim of learning? Why do we even need to learn? Well, because we have to, every step of the way, like every movement that you make, that actually had to be learned. Um, Knowledge allows us, this model of the world that we create, allows us to make decisions, right? And that is really the end goal. We want to create this model of the world that allows us to act in the world, to make decisions that are obviously, you know, in some way in our favor, on biological level, that just help our survival, I suppose. But because we have transcended the, the simple goals of just survival, I guess humans have slightly loftier goals, such as happiness and stuff like that. But yeah, at the end of the day, knowledge enables us to make decisions. So technically, if we want to model this, right, on a computer, if we want to create artificial intelligence, then we need to create something that also can interact with the data, I guess, with the world itself, that can maybe interact with information, so some representation of this world, that can acquire some knowledge of this world, build a useful model of the world, maybe in a limited snapshot of it, maybe not the entire universe, but just like a simple task of telling the difference between cats and dogs or something like that. But still the end goal is once you've learned, once you've acquired the knowledge, this should enable you to make decisions, right? And uh, not surprisingly, if you look at how machine learning genuinely works, that is, that is exactly what we are trying to emulate. Machine learning is some kind of algorithm, right? We're talking about algorithmic approaches. These algorithms will consume some training data. So we obviously, it's a bit hard to just take a computer, like throw it on the lawn and say, all right, you know, stare at the sky and learn. Like computers don't really have the senses that we have as humans. So typically we, we create some snapshots of the world. We create data sets, right? Data, we capture the world in some way. And that is then consumed by the algorithm. That is the data from which the algorithm is supposed to infer some model that will enable it to make decisions. Uh, the process is typically iterative. And I think the same can be said about humans. Um, so yeah, we require a training set and we'll typically expose uh, this data set to our algorithm uh, over and over and over again. And hopefully over time, the algorithm will be able to learn from the data, create some kind of useful model, how do we actually nudge the algorithm to learn? Well, we typically give it some stuff, right? We ask it to make a prediction. And at first, most models begin with a random guess. And the random guess is usually really, really awful and completely off target. But we as humans can say, no, I'm sorry, computer. I know you're trying really hard, but you got it very, very wrong. So let's evaluate and see how off you are exactly. And then using that error, we can actually then guide the computer guide the algorithm to come closer and closer to the actual useful model that can then make predictions, can make decisions that are in fact useful. So again, maybe if we try and to teach a computer to tell the difference between cats and dogs, at first it will have no clue, but as we correct this over and over and over again, hopefully over time it will get a gist of what's happening. Great. 
Cool, I think I covered that. And I did say I'm going to try and speed run this lecture. So let's go on to the next thing. So how exactly do computers learn? What I have described just now is something known as supervised learning. And supervised learning is something I plan to focus on in this lecture. It is not the only paradigm. And because you are here at the Endeavor, you actually are, you have an awesome opportunity to learn about all of these different paradigms. Um, Willem van Heerden is going to be given talk about unsupervised learning, maybe other, other talks on that. Uh, on that particular way of teaching machines to learn will also uh, be in the program. I'm not exactly sure. I know we have a reinforcement learning tutorial happening later today. So yes, uh, all of these ways are valid, but today I'd like to focus on supervised learning. So what exactly supervised means? Um, that essentially means that we have some human in the process. We have raw data, but on top of the raw data, we also have useful information. So for example, if we are showing images to a computer, and we know there are cats and dogs in those images. We don't ask the computer to just magically figure out that there are these two types of, of animals in the pictures. We rather say, well, we as humans can label every single image as either an image of a cat or an image of the dog. And because we have these labels, right, this information, we want the, the machine learning algorithm to look at the raw data, so just the images, and using the information, in other words, targets, labels, figure out this boundary between the two classes. Um, this obviously is super useful. The classification problems are usually solved in this way. Unsupervised learning, again, I'm not going to touch on it, but just to give you a general idea, unsupervised learning is a machine learning paradigm, but you just give data to a computer and you ask the computer to figure something out of the data without you necessarily prescribing the specific targets. How can this be useful? Well, there are obviously many, many different applications. The one that easily comes to mind is um, predicting buyer behavior. Let's say you are an online store and you are interested in selling as many things as possible. So how do you formulate this problem? How do I figure out what the person buys? How do I, like, do I just track if he bought, like, let's say he bought a TV. Should I recommend another TV? And in fact, Google Ads does that sometimes and it annoys me so much. Like I remember I bought a rug and I spent like a month choosing it and it was very expensive and I finally bought it. And for the next two months, I kept seeing rugs in Google Ads. And I'm like, honestly, I'm not going to spend 10,000 rand on another rug. Like I'm done with rugs. Please don't show rugs ever again to me. So yeah. So how do you actually do that then? You can't just track a single person's behavior. You typically See, all right, but if Anna bought a rug, what else does she buy? Maybe she likes pretty things. She buys flower pots and things. Let's see what other people buy that maybe have similar behaviors to Anna. So you would compare me to other buyers, and you wouldn't recommend flower pots and rugs because I bought them before. You'd rather recommend things that I have not bought before, but other people have bought that also bought, let's say, home decor things. And that is clustering. You're not saying you know, recommend specifically that. You rather see what behavior looks like in general. Okay, that's what I'm in a nutshell. But let's move on. Um, supervised learning is the focus of this lecture. It probably is the most popular machine learning paradigm simply because in this case, our goal is usually very, very well defined. So there are two types of problems that we can solve with this paradigm. Classification problems, where you have some you know, specific classes that you want your algorithm to learn to differentiate, so cats versus dogs. And then, of course, the regression problems, let's say, um, you are trying to predict the load shedding schedule. Oh, is it going to go up or is it going to go down? Am I going to go from four to five to six or is it going to go in the opposite direction? So predicting time series, for example, uh, predicting the prices, etc. So in other words, predicting a real value that can also be accomplished by a computer and that is called a regression. Okay, I think I have already defined this too. Hopefully this makes sense to everyone. <laughs> Great, so again, let's do a quick example. Um, I'm not showing you any algorithms yet, so I'm just trying to build intuitions here. So here is a toy example. We have furniture descriptions. Every single piece of furniture has some height and some width. And I mean, I know they technically are three-dimensional, so maybe there should be a length as well, but let's say you are only given these two. And then you are asked to predict the type of furniture and the three types available to you are chair, table, and bed. So uh, do you think it's possible to predict the type based on just the height and the width? Is there any, I mean, do you, do you think there is some pattern here? And another thing while you're thinking about it, note that the outputs themselves uh, are one hot encoded. One hot encoding is also a term that we use a lot in supervised ML. 
it's basically a binary representation where you say if I'm doing classification for every single class, I will have a separate bit in my bit string. And for every single, every single output will then be a bit string. So if I have three classes, chair, table, and bed, I expect my model, whatever the model is, neural network or something else, I expect it to output these three values, right? And if it's a chair, then only the chair bit should be set to one, other two should be zero. If it's a table, only the table should be set to one, other two should be zero. And if it's a bed, you know, you get the gist of it. So that's one token coding. Anyway, so is there a pattern here? Well, I think it's quite easy to realize that chairs generally are smaller than tables. And chairs tend to be slightly like not as tall as tables, right? Otherwise, it would not be comfortable to eat if your table was like down there. Beds, uh, I guess they can be maybe comparable chairs in, some, in terms of height. Maybe they're slightly lower. It depends. But they're usually much wider than chairs. Maybe they can be as wide as tables, but then on the high dimension, hopefully they're different. So there is indeed a pattern here. And it's not obvious from the table because it's just numbers and it's hard to analyze them for you as a human. But obviously, if I showed you the objects, you would have no trouble differentiating between them. So for the model here, what we wanted to figure out is obviously figure out this difference. It, the model needs to figure out the smaller height and widths are typically associated with chairs. And then smaller heights but larger widths are associated with beds and slightly like taller heights, taller than chair and wider than chair, and maybe wider than bed. I don't know, that would be tables, right? Somewhere in between. And the algorithm actually can figure these patterns out and soon enough we'll see how exactly. Here is uh, a an example of regression problem so that you kind of have an idea of how these data sets actually look like. Let's say I want to create a model that will be predicting price of property based on just two input variables, square meters and the number of bedrooms. Again, can you really predict the price from just these two? Well, maybe it won't be the perfect, perfect prediction because maybe you have a huge house with lots of bedrooms but it's like super old and decrepit and everything's falling apart. And I guess your price should then drop. And if it's like newly renovated, it would be more expensive. But still, obviously, the larger the house, the more expensive it's going to be. In this case, the outputs of the model that we will be training will not be a one hot binary thing. It would try to be a real value. We wanted to actually output the price, whatever the algorithm thinks that price should be. And here is another thinky example. Let's say we want to do stock market predictions. So we check, I don't know, Google stocks, and we want to see what's going to happen to those stocks. Do you think this is a classification or a regression problem? Who thinks it's regression? Who thinks it's classification? One person. Nobody thinks it's classification. Well, in my opinion, it can actually be either, right? Of course, you can try to predict the exact value, and that's not easy. In fact, in my opinion, predicting stock markets is almost impossible. There is some mathematical evidence that it's chaotic time series. In other words, very, very uh, poor predictability. But regardless, you can try to predict the actual value. But do you really need the actual value? Maybe you just want to know whether you should buy or you should sell, right? If you formulate the problem that way, if you're just choosing between selling and buying, then all your problem needs to do is monitor how this value changes and tell you, okay, buy, buy, now sell, 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 okay, buy again, you know? So really, whether you form it as one or the other depends on your goal, right? So your final, final, um, I guess, desire, like what do you want to use this model for? Okay, great, everyone on board. So how exactly then are we going to achieve this? Now you know what the data sets look like, it's time for us to go and emulate learning. And with supervised learning, the process is very simple. You start with some environments, right? You start with some model. Your model tries to predict some outputs. And you typically just take those outputs and you compare them to desired outputs. And if they do not match, then, and of course, at first, they probably will not, you typically penalize the model somehow. You try to improve the model to drive that error down, right? To make the error as small as possible. We typically do this iteratively until we arrive at some final answer, right? So the question is, what exactly are we learning here? What is it? Well, I told you it's the model of the world, but in this case, if I'm predicting stock markets, it's the model of this particular stock, right? But uh, yeah, but what, what, what are we learning at the end of the day? I did say there will not be much math, but there will be a little bit of mathematical notation because I think it really helps with understanding 
I think the easiest way to formulate this learning problem is, well, we have some inputs, right? In, in the supervised learning paradigm, we have some data, some variables that describe the various states of the system. And then we have some outputs that we want to arrive at. So inputs would be, um, in my examples, like the dimensions of the furniture, outputs would be the classification, the type of furniture. The stuff in between is the model, and that model can be seen as a function, right? Anything that connects some inputs to some outputs, anything that creates this mapping mathematically, we describe that as a function. So it is this magical function f that we are trying to learn. Question is, can we ever actually learn the truth? Okay, so let's again go back to my favorite example of cats versus dogs. Let's say you have a data set with lots of cats and lots of dogs. And well, I mean, maybe, maybe you have many types of dogs, not necessarily every single breed, but it's a large data set. You train your model for a while and then you deploy it, right? So you put it in production, people are actually using your model to upload a photo of the cat or something, some unknown creature that they saw. And I mean, they don't know if it's a cat or a dog, they want a machine to tell them. Anyway, and let's say the following image gets uploaded. What do you think a model would, would think of that? What, a machine, what would the machine learning make of that? Well, I mean, you know, it's a dog, it's a Pomeranian, and he's really adorable. And I mean, as a human, I guess you can say, oh, he doesn't really look like a cat, like the shape of, even though he's really fluffy in this particular example here, he really looks like a Persian cat, you know, it's not a cat. And maybe your machine learning algorithm will also know that. Or maybe not, because honestly, it depends on how good your data set was. What matters to understand here is that we create this approximation of the mapping between the X and the Y. But the approximation, there is no guarantee that it will ever be perfect. We can only, we, we learn some F hat, we learn some approximation of function F, but we should always be, I guess, aware of the fact that this F will never be a true depiction of reality. And something might stumble into the frame that just wasn't captured by our approximation. And sure, if you had lots of examples of Pomeranians, maybe they will be included. But then perhaps if you give it an image that was taken in very low light, for example, suddenly your neural network or some other model might once again struggle to say if it's a cat or a dog simply because the approximation didn't cater for that particular type of instance. So I think just kind of um, realizing that whatever we produce at the end are always approximations of reality. We can try and come as close as we can to that real F, but very rarely do we, I would say we actually never get there. We never get like the true precision of reality. We can only infinitely approach it with this asymptotic kind of behavior. Okay, so obviously the more examples we have, the better your model becomes. If you only have one example of a cat, one example of a dog, your model will just Put some boundary between them and that boundary obviously will be will work for these two examples but it will not necessarily work for more examples but the more examples you add the better and better and better this boundary actually becomes and that is why large data sets are important that is why they are so useful the better your data sets the bigger the more realistic your approximation becomes Okay, so speaking of this approximation, obviously I already told you that we're going to be evaluating how well it's doing and I guess updating it over time, but how do we actually know how well it's doing? How are we going to even evaluate that? Well, there are many ways to do that. Um, here is again some formulas for you. These are just examples of how the error can be calculated. These three have different properties and I'm going to go through the properties. What is important to note here is essentially all of these three different error functions calculates the difference, right? Between the Y, which is the actual output, and the T, which is the target output. So you take the difference between the two and you accumulate this difference over all of, the, all of the examples in your data set. And that is why we have the sigma. We typically accumulate error over the entire data set, right? And of course, if your Ys are identical to your Ts, then you're doing great. If you are predicting output perfectly for every single output, then there is no error. You have perfectly picked your data set. And that is kind of what we're aiming for, right? We want to Ys to be as close to Ts as possible, and most error functions are designed around that concept. Okay, uh, but 
does this distance really tell you much in case you are working with classification problems, right? I mean, it might or it might not, because one might say, but wouldn't I actually know how many of the examples did I get right exactly? Like, sure, I can calculate some real value, it means squared error, it might be hard to interpret, so perhaps it's better to look at accuracy. And you would indeed be correct in thinking so. With classification errors, we typically still use mean squared error or some real value to train the model, but to evaluate how well your classifier is doing, we typically want to see, all right, but how, well, how many of my positive and negative examples did it get right? And the proportions of this also sometimes matter. So what you're looking at is a confusion matrix, a very typical way of reporting your classification error for binary classification problems. A binary classification problem is a problem that usually outputs exactly two classes, right? It's like a yes or no, cat or dog, or something like that. Of course, if you have more classes, you can just create a more like kind of wider confusion matrix. Anyway, so what we're looking at is the intersection of positives versus negatives. And we usually want to know how many true positives are there. In other words, if there is a cat in the image, how many times will my model correctly say, yes, it's a cat? False positive is when a model thinks there is a cat, but in fact, there is no cat in the image. A true negative is when a model does not say that there is a cat when there is in fact no cat. And a false negative is when a model says there is no cat, but there is actually a cat. We can also calculate sensitivity and specificity, which basically then tell you, right, so what's the proportion of my uh, true positives, what's the proportion of true negatives with regards to the rest of the facts, right? Cool. Um, why is this important? Why can't I just report the accuracy? Can't I just like add all this together and say, all right, so how many did I get right? And sometimes just accuracy, sometimes just checking number of positive true positives and true negatives versus total number of predictions. That can be okay in some cases, but think of uh, cancer prediction, for example. Let's say you developed a model for, uh, for a hospital, right? And your model is supposed to help the doctors. So you take all this test that the person has done, you push it through your model, and the model is like, ah, this tumor is benign, nothing to worry about. A month later, a person comes with terminal cancer, and it's kind of your model's fault. Right? I mean, you don't want something like that to happen. So if you are this, the number of true positives versus true uh, versus true negatives, etc., can be very important in case one class maybe is in fact more important than the other class. Maybe it's okay to kind of err on the side uh, of, you know, being too careful. Maybe it's better to say, hey, I'm not sure if your tumor is benign. It, you know, it kind of looks fine, but like I have my suspicions. Maybe it's better to have some uh, false positives rather than false negatives in this case of cancer prediction, right? So in general, in, in every single problem that you model, be aware of this, that uh, final accuracy is not always the best metric, and it's important to know what actually matters in your case. Another example is underrepresented classes in balanced data sets. Let's say you have 90% of your data belongs to class A and 10% belongs to class B. What do you think would be the accuracy of your model if it always outputs A and never outputs B? You technically have two classes. You want to predict both. But your model goes totally lazy and says, you know what, I'll always just say it's It's easy. What would be the accuracy? So 90% of your data set is A, 10% is B, and model goes like it just does always A. So what's, what's, the, what's the accuracy of your model? It's 90%. It's, you can the accuracy, you're like, wow, I'm, I'm beating this. I'm doing great. And then you realize that it's utterly useless because it will never, ever, ever, ever actually output B. So it learned absolutely nothing. Your data set is just hugely unbalanced and you didn't kind of think about that. So yeah, confusion matrices tell you the truth. Great, moving on. So um, once you get these metrics, um, where to from then? How do you actually know if your model is good? Is it enough to say, hey, my error is zero, I nailed it? Unfortunately not. What next thing that we need to think about is this a very important concept of fitting the model just right. So I told you we are looking for an approximation. So what you're looking at in the picture, the yellow dots are the data, right? So that's, that's the environment, that's the world that we are trying to model. And of course, you can clearly see that there is a bit of a curve here, right? My yellow dots are curved. So I think the model in the middle looks the most realistic. It really captures the trend nicely. 
The model on the left will get some of these points right, others not so much. So something like this we usually call underfitting. Clearly, the model is nonlinear. We are trying to fit it with a line, and the line will never be able to become a curve. So this particular type of model will never actually give us a good enough approximation for always underfit. On the other hand, if our model is extremely overparametrized and we have a lot of wiggle room, we can fit something that basically goes through every single point in the data set. And this will give you zero error on the training set. And you might think, yeah, you know, maybe this is better. But in reality, because it fits every single point so well, it kind of kept, fails to capture the overall trends. And if you ask it to do predictions on points that maybe fall outside of this range, your model is likely to predict something utterly useless. So when you overfit, it's bad because you kind of overlearn this particular data set. You become super good at your data set and bad at anything that was not represented by your data set. So you fail to generalize entirely. And obviously that's, that's awful. That once again makes your model useless. So what we want is something right there in the middle. Okay, so um, again, coming back to this, uh, I already told you that getting 100% accuracy does not mean your model is good. It simply means you've learned the data set, but uh, it might actually not be good at all when you apply it outside of the data set. So how do we check that if your model is learning the general trends or if it's just memorizing data points like an idiot? Well, maybe we should measure its ability to generalize, right? And how do we do that? The easiest way is so simply take your training, simply take your entire data set, right? And from the very beginning, split it two ways and say, all right, oh, the majority of the data sets, 90%, 70%, whatever like fits your budget there, you're going to use to fit your model. But the remainder, 30, 10%, some, some part of data, you will keep secret and safe and not show to your model at all until it is actually done training. And when it is done, when your model is there all shiny with its arrow of zero, you say, okay, and now the real test. Can you give me the correct outputs for the test set? If your model fails there, well, you know, it's useless and you maybe should try again and perhaps not train for so long or something like that. So typically, well, okay, this one is in terms of epochs and there is just a name for iteration when we train neural networks. But anyway, typically the graphs look as follows. So the red line is the awesome improving accuracy for your training set. And usually when you start training the model, both the accuracy on your training set and the accuracy on your test set are going to go up. So the model will become gradually more and more and more and more accurate to your delight until it finally reaches this breaking point where on the training set, it still looks like it's getting better, but on the test set, you actually realize it's becoming worse and worse and worse and worse, uh, generalizing, and that is the exact consequence of overfitting, which is probably the most important concept in entire supervised uh, machine learning paradigm. So how do we actually prevent overfitting? First of all, always keep some data on the side and kind of keep track of how well your model is generalizing. If at any point you see that your generalization accuracy is starting to drop rather than to grow, then take a few steps back and just say, okay, hold on there. I shouldn't actually train any further because if I do, my model will overlearn. And for me as a lecturer, this actually maps really nicely to how students learn as well. This is why I never release the memos, because if you give a student a memo, the student will hope that if they memorize the memo word for word, they will walk into my test, I'll ask the exact same questions, and they will get 100%. Problem is, I never ask the same questions. So if they just memorize the memo, they completely wasted their time, they didn't learn anything useful, and yeah, if there are any of my students here present, hopefully you now appreciate why I was so mean to you. There is a reason behind my madness. Great. So, um, yeah, just dividing your data set into a training and a test set is obviously a good way to do generalization. But one might wonder, yes, but how do I know that my generalization set is actually representative enough? You know, what if I only have 10 patterns there? And again, going back to the example of Pomeranians, maybe after 100 breeds, Pomeranian didn't feature into the test set. So I might think I'm generalizing, but in fact, I'm really horrible at predicting Pomeranians, right? It could be the case. So is there any way to estimate generalization error using the entire data set rather than the signing little subset? And I am here to tell you that yes, there is in fact a way and we call it cross-validation. Specifically, k-fold cross-validation, super useful idea, very, very simple. 
So what your K stands for the number of folds in your validation. In this picture, we have 10 folds. What this basically means is you take your entire data set and you break it down into equally sized chunks, right? Then you say, right, so I have this 10 chunks. I'm going to train my model 10 times. And every single time I will use a different, a different set of chunks. So in the beginning, I use the first nine to train the model and the 10th to predict generalization. In the next iteration, I use the first eight and the 10th to train a model. And then I use this chunk number nine to do generalization. And I repeat this process until every single subset of the data set has in fact been used to calculate the generalization error. And then to, to get an idea of how well your model generalizes to the entire data set, you're going to take all of these errors for all of these little blue chunks, you're going to sum them together and you're going to divide them by the number of chunks, by the number of folds, and that will give you the generalization performance across the entire data set. And that's actually really, really awesome. So in case you guys are doing your PhDs or masters, this is a great way to test your model because you get like generalizations as representative as it, as it goes. And of course, well, it's a bit expensive, especially if you have many folds, but it's worth it, right? Your generalization error is quite representative. Cool. Okay, so I think we're finally ready to design our first learning algorithm. Can anybody tell me how I'm doing on time? Anyway, I'll just keep going. Yes. Sure. What's your final model that you take? That's a good question. Well, I would, yeah, it's, 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 it's a good question. You can pick the best one, I suppose, like out of the 10, pick the one which generalizes the best, because obviously if there are some worse ones, uh, I mean, overall you will get, um, well, it kind of gives you an idea overall. Although some would say um, you can do an even better way to, is actually to combine this with the previous method. So what I think is the best way to kind of do it is, sorry, I don't want to go too far. But yeah, that's like, it's a really good trick question that you asked there. I want the picture, where's my picture? Anyway, there we go. So what you can do in the beginning is do a training set and a test set, then do K folds on the training set and maybe tweak your parameters to make sure that your K fold error goes as low as possible, right? So like you really try to train your model super well on the training set by reducing generalization, by tweaking various parameters like number of layers in neural network or something like that. Once you're happy, you're like, all right, this K-folds error is as good as it gets. Now I will take the inside training set and just train the model without subdividing. So use all 10 folds and then do the final sanity check after I've switched the parameters. And then you train it without K-folding. You say, right, and now let's check how I'm actually doing on this additional chunk that I haven't even used for tweaking parameters. Because technically, when you're tweaking a parameter, you are still kind of um, kind of sending some knowledge to the neural network. You might be overfitting to the generalization error in a sense. Does that make sense? Cool. So I think that would probably be like the most valid way of doing it. But yeah, that's definitely a very, very valid question, clearly coming from a practitioner. Great. Um, cool. Let's design the first machine learning algorithm for this lecture. It's going to be very simple. Um, let's go with my toy example. I know it's not very fascinating, but I'm sorry, this is all I could think of. So we have these two dimensions, the height and the width, and we want to predict the type of furniture. So let's do a quick experiment, see if you guys are good at this, if human intelligence beats machines. So these are the three classes. I mean, that's the height, right? And that's the width. So I think these would be chairs right here. They're the smallest in terms of height and width. This is slightly like higher height, I guess, and bigger width. So these are probably tables and I suppose this must be beds. And then let's say I show you an example and I say it's located right there. Which one do you think is it gonna be? And forget beds and chairs, it's too complicated. Is it the black dots? Is it the big white dots? Or is it the small white dots? Which one do you think is most likely? Who thinks it's the small white dots? Nobody thinks that, right? Who thinks it's the small black dots? Most people think, it's, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that makes sense. It's the closest to them, right? So it looks like it, it, it um, black dot, cool. Yes, good, good, good job, Gabriel, you are right. Okay, example number two, black dots, a small white dots or big white dots? Which one is it gonna be? Small white dots, yes, you guys are great at this. And the last one, I think, also obvious, it's kind of in between, but I would still say it's the closest to the big white dots. 
Well, congratulations. You have just performed nearest neighbor learning algorithm. And this is technically, I think, the easiest machine learning algorithm, and it is actually super, super useful. So the idea behind K nearest neighbors is, well, let's just go with simple nearest neighbor. You get a pattern that you have not seen before. You don't know what its class is. You don't have a model or anything, but you have this data set with labels. So how about you take your example, you compare it to everything in the data set, and you pick the example that is the closest, just in terms of Euclidean distance, right? And you say, cool, all right, this one's the closest, Hey, closest neighbor, what's your class? Oh, it's black dot. Okay, I think I'm also that. I think we fit together. Um, and this actually works surprisingly well. And many recommended systems are in fact built on this. I told you, like, how does one know what to sell to Anna? Well, just see what who other what what people in Anna's neighborhood buy, and maybe offer her those things because, like, maybe Anna shares some interests. Like, I like board games. Advertise some board games to me. Maybe some board games I wasn't aware of, but somebody in my like neighborhood bought them. Okay, so uh, what is important here is we don't actually have a model, right? The data itself is the model. It's it's the labeled examples that tell you the labeling for examples which do not have labels. There is actually no learning, so to speak, um, and this is why we call nearest neighbor a lazy learning algorithm. It can make predictions. But it doesn't actually learn, it just does uh, the distances and then takes the best guess. Just to expand it further, <coughs> we typically uh, speak of k-nearest neighbors rather than nearest neighbors. For the same, uh, for the similar, re uh, sorry, for the simple reason that asking a couple of neighbors typically gives you a better general idea of where you fit. So um, if I take like three neighbors around me, that will maybe give me a better prediction rather than just, and I mean, this example in the picture is actually confusing because as you can see the star is actually kind of right in the smack middle between the yellow and the purple. So if I take three neighbors, I will think that the star is a purple class. But if I take six neighbors, then actually it will have more yellow neighbors than purple neighbors. So technically, because it is on average, if I take six closer to the yellow class, maybe it should actually be yellow class, but really this is the borderline but this kind of tells you that number of neighbors does in fact have an influence on your decision boundary at the end of the day. Cool. Um, yeah, so I guess the immediate question is, but then how do I know which K to use? Should it be three, should it be six? Uh, well, again, how do we know that? Uh, like I have just described, you can tweak the parameters. So why not split your data set into training and test, then train your train, take your training set, perform K fold cross-validation on it, and then see which K actually generalizes the best overall, right? And then that K would be your K of choice. And of course, there are some basic kind of recommendations. If you have a two class problem, then maybe doing an odd K is better because you immediately prevent ties. So that makes your life easier. But yeah, typically when you, when you are just not sure what parameters to use, do some cross-validation and figure out which one helps you generalize the best. Because at the end of the day, generalization is really all we truly care about. Cool. So again, just to put it in a visual perspective, what happens as you increase K, it kind of smoothens your boundary. In this case, with K of just one, for example, you might have like these little clusters in the middle. So your boundary is very, very granular, basically. And as you take more and more and more neighbors in, your boundary between clusters becomes smoother and smoother, it becomes more and more averaged, so to speak. So uh, here, going from K of 1 to K of 25, I can really make my boundary smoother. And of course, as a result, some of the purple dots fall on the wrong side of the line, some of the yellow lines fall on the wrong side. But those uh, could just be, uh, you know, maybe it's just noise in my data. This smoother boundary generally tends to be preferred because it's usually the smooth boundary that generalizes better. Okay, um, something else we didn't talk about, but probably should mention is preparation of the data itself. I already mentioned that if your data set, for example, is extremely unbalanced, you have 90% of one and 10% of the other, you are already in trouble, you should probably do something about it. And there are ways to deal with that, which I'm not going to cover in this lecture, but let's talk about something more immediate. Let's say we are doing K nearest neighbors. And for this particular problem, we have the following three parameters. So the first parameter, as you can see, is like one, two, some integers, right, between one and 10, maybe. Second parameter is tiny values. So like 10 to the power of negative three or something like that, small, smallish values. And the 
third, third variable is in fact in a totally different order of magnitude. We're looking at 1,000 and 10,000 and stuff like that. So if I just use these values as is, and I calculate the distances between X and Y, out of these three variables, which one do you think will contribute the most to the distance? The third one, right? Yes, it's gonna be the third one because it's the biggest. It's like the difference between 0 0.002 and 0 0.015, it becomes irrelevant. If you compare it to the difference between 1,800 and 1,000, like that's 300. So the difference between one and two and this parameter, it's, it's irrelevant. Essentially your third variable completely dominates your distance code calculation and you base your decision on just one variable, even though you actually have three in your data set. And that's, that's awkward because maybe the first two are also important. They're just on different scales, but it does not actually make them less important. So what we tend to do, and this applies to KNN, as well as many other algorithms, neural nets as well, we usually want all of our data to be on the same comparable scale. So that all of these individual variables actually contribute the same. And there are many ways to do that if you know the exact mean and max boundaries of your given inputs and the, and the, the range for which you're going. You can do mix, mean max scaling. Otherwise, uh, a very safe way that I personally prefer is that score normalization, also known as standardization. For every single variable, so every single column in your data set, you calculate the mean and the standard deviation. Then you go through every single pattern and for that value, you subtract the mean and you divide by the standard deviation. And that basically takes your original distribution of that particular variable values and it standardizes it. In other words, it ensures that the mean is now at zero and the variance is roughly at one. And this is great because for standardization, you don't need to know in the mean and the max. Um, it's not too sensitive to outliers. Anyway, so going forward, I suggest you use Z-score, normalization, standardization. But this is important to make sure that every variable in the end contributes. Okay, so clearly K and N is a cool, simple algorithm. It's so elegant, it's really beautiful. Can you, however, use it for other tasks besides uh, classification? Can you, for example, use it for regression tasks? Answer is yes. Yes, you can. And what you would do in this case is you would still have your patterns, right? You can still calculate distances between your input variables. But if your output is not a target class, but rather a target value, you can say, well, I take six neighbors, I see what their output is, and I calculate the average of that, and then the average of that will be my output. So why is K and N awesome? Because it's super elegant and intuitive. There is no simple algorithm out there, I think, in the whole machine learning field. It has only one parameter to tune, which is super easy, just case. The only parameter to worry about. There is no training. You have the data set and you are good to go. You can start making predictions. You can also easily expand it. If more data arrives, you just throw it at the problem and hopefully your, your algorithm becomes more and more precise. So uh, all of the awesome things. Can anybody guess what, the, what are kind of the disadvantages of this approach? Because obviously all of this comes at some price. So what do you think would be the price of K and N. What's, what, what can possibly be bad about this awesome thing? Well, in my opinion, quite a few things. First of all, it is slow, especially if your data set is huge and if it keeps growing, right? We keep talking of big data. What if, if you have to compare to 10 examples, that's fine. Hundreds, yeah, computer can deal with thousands. I would even say 10,000 is doable, but in the modern world, in the 21st century, we sometimes deal with millions of examples. And if it's Google and it's trying to do search, uh, I don't know, predictions, like can it really compare you to every single user on the internet? I don't think so. It becomes infeasible if you really try to use every single pattern. Well, luckily there are methods that allow you to kind of find centroids, throw away examples that are very similar, et cetera. So yes, you can read out your data set, but still it is generally speaking slow because you have to compare exhaustively to all of these patterns. And yeah, it's, it's slow, it's not, not fast. Also, we actually do not derive a model at the end of the day. Like I said, data is a model and it's awesome. And also not so awesome because sure we can make predictions, but we don't have this nice function that we can plot, something that we can analyze. It's um, like it kind of remains a black box. We, yeah, sure, we automatically find clusters. We don't even know what their boundaries are. There is no model really to appreciate at the end of the day, no model to explain the behavior with. 
And then finally, distances between parents. The distance is a weird thing. Mathematics is a strange, strange world to operate in. Distances, Euclidean distance specifically, makes perfect sense if you have one dimension to 100 even. But as your dimensionality increases, so if you have lots and lots of, let's say you have a million input variables, and you might say not that many problems have that many input variables. But if you do have a million input variables, distance actually tends to converge to a constant. So distance loses its meaning in high dimensions. So if you if you rely 100% on distance, you might kind of hear wall if, if your problem becomes very high dimensional. Okay, so let's talk about something else then. KNN is good and it's bad, so let's try to think of something better. Let's say, um, let's say you, let's again do a real life example, you feel bad, you, I don't know, your, your stomach aches, you go to a GP, to a doctor, um, and what, how is he going to know what's, what to do with you, right? Is he going to send you for every single possible test in existence? I mean, because how does KNN do, does do a prediction? It compares you to every single other patient, right? Uh, essentially, that the GP has ever seen. Would a GP take your file, say, hold on, I just have to check my other 500 patients and figure out who is, no, obviously that's not how it's done in real life. So what the GP will do instead, he'll say, all right, well, your tummy is sore, you know, like, what did you eat? Maybe did you eat expired food or something like that? First check, no, you didn't eat expired food. Okay, let's talk some, let's, let's talk about your, I don't know, your family history. Maybe you had ulcers in the past or something like that. So he will rather systematically put you through a number of logical tests that kind of logically follow from one another. And hopefully through the sequence of tests, uh, he would then arrive, he or she, We'll arrive at the final um, prediction. And obviously, GP might not know everything, but maybe he'll then know which specialist to send you to, etc. But important thing here is we are not going to compare you to every single patient in the hospital. We would rather do a specialized thing where for you specifically, we check the stuff that makes sense in your case, and we narrow the search down to a particular disease. So this seems useful. How do we model something like this? And some of you might already know the answer, but because I'm trying to speed run it, I'll just go straight for the answer. The answer to this is decision trees. And decision trees are exactly what you think they are. It's trees of decisions that logically follow from one another. So it's a flow-like structure and very important if you're not from computer science background, in computer science, the trees grow upside down. So the top of the tree, we call the roots. And then the bottom of the tree, we call the leaves. So it's like, an upside down tree. I don't know, sometimes students find it confusing, but that's the terminology. So this particular example is kind of stupid, but it's a picture I could steal off the internet, so I'm going with it. The, our input variables are outlook, whether it's rainy or overcast or sunny, temperature, humidity, and whether it's windy or not. And based on, on these four variables, we want Siri to make a prediction of whether you should go play golf or not. So you take yourself and you say, hey Siri, should I play golf? And then Siri can go ahead and say, all right, so let's check. Um, is it rainy? Is it sunny? Like, what's the weather like? If it's overcast, it will say, yeah, just go for it. Overcast weather is apparently awesome for golfing. Um, these are, I guess, examples of, I don't know, prior golf players that have expressed their opinions on whether you should go for it or not. Anyway, so going through these various variables, we can say, well, for example, if it's rainy and it's like really cat, raining cats and dogs, then don't play golf. But if it's a light drizzle, then it's okay, go for it. If it's sunny and it's windy, then, you know, maybe it's too much, you'll get awful sunburn, don't go for it. But if it's sunny and it's not windy, it's like this lovely day, then you should do it. Anyway, this is a stupid example, but this could be medical tests as well. Maybe that would make it more useful. What's important is we want to systematically make... Um, Okay, I see a question, but I think I'll try to handle that later. We want to systematically make decisions. Hopefully that makes sense to everyone. So you start at the roots, in other words, at the top of this upside down tree, you ask a question. So you pick a few many variables, you pick one variable, and for that variable you say, okay, what is the value for that variable? And based on that value, you then go to a branch. And then once you've branched out, you say, all right, so we've made a choice on that variable, Let's go for the next, oh my goodness, 15 minutes. This is so sad. I will not get to neural networks at all. Thanks, thanks, Lang. And maybe I'll just speed run this then. Yeah, and then as you go along, you can obviously refine your decisions. So how do we model this using a computer? I'm going to jump straight to the answer. We do it recursively. 
we um, we need to have some metric of uh, that will tell us which variable is the best split on, right? And then we split on that metric. We now, out of the 10 variables, picked one. We average split on that variable. We don't consider the variable again, but we have to pick out of the remaining nine which one to split on next. So out of those nine, again, pick the one that is somehow best in terms of splitting. Then you pick that, and then you, uh, you remain with eight. And so you keep going until you run out of variables, right? So the big question then is, how are we going to know which variable is the best to split on, right? Out of my 10 variables, how do I know which one to go for? And that's the place where I throw a bit more math at you. What we are going to do is we're going to calculate information gain. In other words, we want the tree to come closer and closer to making the final decision. And to calculate how close it is to the final decision, we are going to be calculating entropy. Entropy is a beautiful, beautiful concept that I absolutely love. It is officially a measure of chaos or disorder or surprise in the data set. So if you have, um, let's say you have a bag, right? It's opaque. It's like a nice velvet bag. You can't see through it. Um, and uh, you know there are two colors of balls, the red ones and the green ones, right? If I tell you, hey, here is a bag. It only has red balls in it. Pick one at random. You pick one out of at random and then I say, okay, yes, the color. Well, if you know they're all red, that's like, that's not even interesting. You know, it's going to be red. There is zero surprise at all. So we say if all balls are the same color, entropy is zero. There is no entropy, no disorder. You can always perfectly predict what the output is. If I say, if I give you the same bag and I say 90% of the balls are red and 10% are green, take one out, put, uh, take one out, guess what the color is. If you guess red, you'll be, you'll be correct most of the time. And sometimes you'll be wrong. Sometimes you'll be surprised with this occasional green ball. So when there is a mixture, but one color is prevalent, there is some entropy, but not much. And if your green and red are completely mixed up 50-50, then it's 100% surprise. You can always guess, but there is always a 50% chance you'll get it wrong. So that's the highest error rates that we can have. So that is basically the highest entropy that we can have in this set. Now, how does this map to decision trees? Um, and I think visually it's quite easy to explain, right? So we start with the data set. And let's say we have two options. We can either split on one attribute, which will give us these two subsets, or we can split on another attribute and arrive at these three, three subsets. Which one do you think is better? Well, obviously, at the end of the day, we want to arrive at the leaves, so bottom of the tree, that have as few example uh, that have as, as little entropy in them as possible. If we are differentiating between the stars and the blue dots, our leaf nodes, we want them to be just stars or just dots, because then we, via our multiple decisions, will arrive at the perfect kind of, it's called a pure leaf that only has one class, and that allows us to say, well, if you've arrived at this leaf and this leaf is full of stars, then you're also a star. On the other hand, if it's full of blue dots, then you're also a blue dot. So out of these two splits, just eyeballing it, which one do you think is better, the one on the left and the one on the right? Uh, Gabriel is just is just uh, spoiling it for everyone. Yes, it's the one on the left. That's correct. Because, well, you can actually mathematically calculate the amount of information gained, the reduction in entropy. We typically calculate entropy at the top, at the roots, right, at the previous, previous step. And then we split and we calculate the average entropy across all of our re well, the leaves that we get out of it. And then we take the difference between the original entropy and the sum of the resulting entropies. And we basically want the difference to be as big as possible. We want to reduce entropy as much as we can with the split. <laughs> no, it's cool, Gabriel. I'm just joking. Thanks a lot. Thanks for being so interactive. Cool. Um, I'm sure Lang is going to tell me when I have one second left. But I think since he hasn't stopped me yet, I'll keep going. All right, so um, great. That's decision trees in a nutshell, um, and it's awesome. But um, maybe we can make it even better by using more than just one tree. Again, going back to a medical example, let's say you have this stomach ache that's just persistent. And you go to the GP and you're like, I did not eat um, expired food and I'm still sore. What's happening? And your GP is like, you know what? I think your appendix is probably about to burst. So let's book you in for the operation tomorrow. Actually, let's do it today. I mean, you might just accept it as the truth, or you might be like, yeah, but shouldn't we like do more tests? Maybe like speak to a specialist or something. I don't want to just go and, you know, be sliced up. So generally when the case is severe, you want to maybe talk to multiple doctors. 
In fact, a GP is usually, it's called a general practitioner. He has a general idea. He doesn't have specialized knowledge. And quite typically, if your case is more than just a common cold, he will be sent to specialists who can then tell you more precisely what's wrong with your body and you know, how to make it better. And we can actually emulate something similar in machine learning using something known as ensemble learning. And the awesome thing about ensemble learning is if you ever want to win a Kaggle competition, this is what you use. Um, ensemble learning is this concept of training multiple models from a single data set and kind of averaging and uh, using, using voting or something like that to figure out what the final output is. So in our case, we want to have a single data set, create multiple trees from the data set, and then ask all of these trees to give us a prediction. And then we average the prediction or we do um, a, a majority vote or something like that to decide what the final output is. Okay, so um, how are we going to actually train multiple trees to make them different? Because if we just take the same data set and we train 10 trees on the same data set, there will be 10 identical trees and that's super useless because they will all always be in agreement and we do not actually want them to agree. We want the trees to specialize. So what we're going to do is we're going to do bagging, which is an abbreviation for bootstrap aggregating. 10 minutes, I think I'm speed running this part. Maybe I will get to neural nets in the last minutes of this show. Okay, so we take our data set and we start creating subsets. And from the data sets, the subsets are going to be sampled with, um, with replacement, which basically means that you, you sample randomly and you do not force the, um, the subsets to kind of be unique. I might, and I don't even force my samples to be representative. Like the first sample, as you can see, has three pink dots, even though I only had two in my original data set. So some point got sampled twice. And I didn't sample any yellows, I didn't sample any blues, and that's fine, actually. This is going to be a tree that specializes in pink dots versus the rest. Then the second one has blue, yellow, red, and green. It doesn't have any black, it doesn't have any pink. So it's going to be really awful at uh, differentiating between pink and black, but that's fine. That's not where it specializes. And then the final one doesn't have any green, for example, so this one will be useless at green but it will be maybe good at other things. It looks like it has a nice sample of red and yellow. So maybe it will be very good at telling the difference between those two. Now that we have this specialized um, data sets, we can create our specialized trees and then our specialized trees can work together to come up with a final decision. Um, why is this good? Well, also on top of this, so th this particular bag and just bags the samples, but we can also do the same bagging on the features. In other words, the input variables themselves. We can say, well, actually not every tree has to look at all 10 variables. Maybe every tree will only look at five input variables and will randomly pick different five. And once again, this allows your trees to specialize. So if we combine feature bagging with sample bagging, what we actually get is a random forest. And this is just an illustration of what specializing means. So these are my four different trees. As you can see, one really focuses on circles versus these triangles. Another one for very much focuses on like these triangles, um, etc. So the boundaries that they create are different. But if you combine the four together, well, actually, I think in this case, one, two, and three are the specialized ones. But if I combine these three different boundaries, I can have a mutual boundary, final boundary, that actually does the perfect split between the classes. And that's by combining my three specialists together. So combining specialists is known as random forests. Cool. So yeah, we basically train multiple trees. Not going to repeat myself. Still hoping to get to neural nets, perhaps. They, they were, Tom was coined in 2001. I guess that's not really that important. Um, yeah, what is important, however, and I'll quickly mention it, is generalization error. I already told you we want models to generalize. Now, with trees, how we measure the generalization performance is we calculate something known as out-of-bag error. And so out-of-bag error simply means that for every single pattern, we will see how well that pattern was predicted by the majority vote of the trees that didn't actually use that particular pattern in their sample. So they were completely blind to this particular sample, right? but they still learn from other samples and hopefully their prediction can still tell us the correct class or you know, real value for doing regression for that particular pattern. And we do that for the entire data set and that tells us how well we generalize. 
Interpretability suffers a bit. The nice thing about decision trees is they are awesome, transparent models. It's literally a set of rules. It's so clear cut. It's super, super easy to interpret. Now, because we have 100 trees, boundaries become fuzzy. Five minutes. At least I can, I can finish random for us. Um, so you can actually gain some interpretability via figuring out which variables were the most instrumental to making your prediction. And how we usually estimate variable importance with random forests is we, well, we feed our forest to the data set, right? Then we call, we record the um, out of bag error for each data point. And then we say, cool, let's now go through every single variable. And for that variable, take all of the inputs for that variable and completely randomize them across the data set. And once again, calculate the out of bag error with the data set with this particular variable totally shuffled. Now, if the variable was important, then obviously shuffling it will completely trash your model. The model will not know what's going on because this variable was like the first choice for all of the trees. And now you took it away and it just can't make tail, tails or heads out of it, right? That means your variable was important. On the other hand, if you shuffle the variable, the model's like, you know what? I'm still 99% accurate. So that variable, take it or leave it, right? This is useful because at least in your 100 variables, you can say, well, these are important. These metrics really tell me what the final outcome should be. And these ones, maybe I can even throw away for the sake of efficiency. Okay, so I think that's, yeah. So um, what exactly do we model with decision trees and, and um, random forests? I already told you that every single split kind of makes a single boundary, right? Essentially, every single, every single node in your tree sets some thresholds, right? You can either go left, you can go right, or you can go three ways if you maybe have three branches, but still it's kind of this once off decision that you make. So in the end, your boundaries are very rectangular, which is actually not always very convenient, right? Because your data most of, often is not linear. And yes, these boundaries are non-linear, but they are kind of blocky, you know, they're kind of pixelated. With random forests, you get a bit of fuzziness, but you know the pixelization is still there to some extent. So again, this is an approximation of the real of the real truth, right? And it can be very useful. But I told you we can never really model the true thing. So this is what we settle for, and this oftentimes is good enough. And the next thing that I wanted to talk about, and unfortunately I truly don't have time for it, is how do we actually move away? from these blocky boundaries that are, well, hard to fit to our very nonlinear data. And the answer to that is neural networks. They are magical function approximators that can fit nonlinear boundaries that can be arbitrarily complex functions, basically. Um, how many minutes do I have left? Two minutes. Okay, I can do this in two minutes. Let's go. <laughs> so, um, new, new, sorry? Oh, I see. So those who do not want to eat can stay. Artificial neural networks obviously were inspired by the human brain. A human brain is a bunch of interconnected neurons, right? Neurons are these awesome cells that interact with each other via uh, electric signals. So a single neuron kind of accepts um, electric impulses from fellow neurons and whatnot. And I mean, they, I guess they originate from your senses and whatnot. And once enough signals have been accumulated, the neuron fires an impulse, and that impulse basically propagates through these networks of neurons. And different things that you experience, different things that you do, thoughts, actions, uh, muscle movements, all of them actually activate different patterns of these signals in your brain. And that's uh, awesome, and we still don't exactly know how it works, but that's kind of the rough idea. And this is exactly what uh, they tried to model back in 1957 with the idea of a perception or an artificial neuron. So this was supposed to model this one neuron in the human brain, one single building block. The idea is you take a bunch of inputs. So, I mean, if you're thinking of classification, this could be the variables, right? And then why couldn't be your output? Let's say you're using a single neuron to do just classification. So my, all of the axes can be input pixels, for example, and Y can be cat versus dog, right? Although I should actually simplify it, back in 1957, perception was completely binary. So all of your inputs had to be zeros or ones. The output also had to be a zero or a one. And the idea was the following. Okay, so let's simulate this neuron. Let's take all of these binary inputs, multiply them by some weights, and the weights are real values, which is very important. We do not know what they are. 
but we can find out, we can fit these weights to this function that we are trying to model, right? So we start with random weights, and then we somehow want to derive an algorithm to iteratively update these weights such that this uh, function here actually maps, um, max, maps my x's to my y's. I'll skip over the math. Uh, hopefully, uh, let me rather give you an intuition. So what, again, what exactly are we modeling? I told you that we want to move away from these blocky boundaries. What exactly are you looking at with the neuron? Well, we have some inputs. We multiply them by some weights. We add these together. We also subtract some thresholds, right? And then we get the outputs. If anybody uh, did math, um, you should probably know that this looks very, very similar to the equation of a line. And this is super important. A single neuron in the neural network essentially models a single line. That is all it does. And yes, it can be very high dimensional. So you, we call it a hyperplane rather than a line. But this is very important. A single neuron is 100% linear, but the slope of your line can be completely arbitrary. The slope is determined by your weights. And the weights, we start with random, and then we train them. I see Lang is getting on my case. Is it? Can I just keep going? OK, let's. Cool, cool, cool. All right, to people online, we are forfeiting lunch for this. But I'll still try to, I'll still try to speed run this. Great, um, cool. So we are modeling a straight line and it's important, it's crucial. Even if your neural network is super deep and complex and has a million layers, every single neuron will still model just this hyperplane. They are forever linear, there is nothing we can do about it. Mathematically, this is the most important part about neural nets. Well, almost. So how do we then find this perfect slope? Let's say we are dealing with a problem where a line is actually sufficient. It's just that we don't want the blocky stuff. We want this nice line at this arbitrary angle. How do we find that arbitrary angle? How do we find a weight? Um, well, we're going to start with a random set. Um, yeah, math is very important for neural nets. That is definitely a correct observation. Cool. So. Um, what we're going to do is start with a random, random set of weights. So we start with a random angle. And then we say, great, how is this random boundary, random line? How does it do on telling the difference between my A's and my B's, my cats and my dogs? And at first, it will actually be doing very poorly. But you can calculate the error. And you can say, I'm sorry, this is actually really wrong. Let's adjust your weights a little bit. Let's nudge them in the right direction. Um, so how do we do that? What you're looking at is the perception learning rule that was envisioned and implemented back in 1957. This is the learning rule um, used for binary, binary um, perceptrons, but something very, very similar is actually used for neural nets. And I, this is a formula, but I will explain it, and I think it's crucial just to understand how these updates actually work. And this is how I like explain it. This is how I really like to explain it to my students. So remember, x's are binary, y's are binary. We're dealing just with ones and zeros. Only the weights are non-binary. Weights are real values. So we start with some random stuff, random weights, and we get some random outputs. And then we calculate the error. If t is equal to O, so if both are zero or both are one, then there is no error, and we do nothing. However, is one of them? If one of them is a one and the other one is a zero then we have something to talk about. So let's see, if target is zero, so we wanted our neural network, our neurons, so it's just a single neuron, the perceptron. We wanted the perceptron to output a zero, but it actually gave us a one. What exactly does that mean? Well, we wanted a zero. We basically did not want this neuron to activate, but it did activate. It tried too hard, so clearly its input signal was maybe too strong. It fires when it should not have fired. So we want to dampen it, right? We don't want it to fire next time it sees this example. Let's look at this formula. T is zero. O is one. Zero minus one is minus one, right? So um, X is zero, one, so that's positive. In other words, this update will definitely be negative, right? It's, it's going to be, a basically, it's going to be a negative value. So we're going to take this weight and we're going to try and reduce it, right? We're going to make it smaller, and it makes sense because we overshot. We wanted to zero, we got a one, so we're going to decrease the weight. On the other hand, using the very same formula, if we flip the two values around, if the target is one, but the output is zero, then we wanted the perception to fire, but it didn't. It just outputted a zero. That's not good enough. T minus zero is going to give us a one. So now, now the update is positive. And that's great. And this little squiggly thing, that's eta, it's the learning rate. Uh, usually it's a parameter, something smaller than one, just some value by which we scale the update, right? 
And now because we undershot, we didn't output enough, we gave zero when one was expected, and we now have a positive delta, so weight will actually be increasing. So clearly, we decrease in the weight when we output too much, and we increase the weight when we output too little. And that really all there is to it. When you do back propagation derivations, you arrive at extremely similar formulas that basically dampen the weights when your neural nets, uh, when, when your neurons fire when they shouldn't, and they increase the weights when your neural when the neurons stay uh, shut when they actually should have fired. Really, that's all. That's like that's where the magic happens. Okay, and 1957. This was envisioned so long ago. So what exactly then happens when your perception learns? You show it pattern after pattern, and for every pattern you can say, all right, here is the error. Let's update the weights. We've moved the, the threshold a little bit. Let's show it another example. Now it's the threshold a bit more. Let's show it another example. Now it's the threshold a bit more. And so we iteratively update this angle, right, of a happy plane more and more until it hopefully fits the data as well as it possibly can. Cool. Okay, so that was the perception envisions and implemented successfully in 1957. Have we moved further from 1957, or is that still the technology that we use? Well, technically, that is still the backbone of neural nets, although we have actually moved away from binary to real values. These days, with modern deep learning networks, usually the weights are still continuous values, real values. Xs and Ys are now also allowed to be real values, although, of course, if you're doing classification, it is still convenient to have your Ys as binary, one plot encoded, but if you're doing regression, Y can also be a real value. Everything can be a real value here. Okay, so I haven't spoken about the activation function yet, but it is actually very important. So I have told you with perceptrons, we want to output a zero or a one, right? But what, what if we have a bunch of ones? right? We multiply them by some weights, and these weights can be anything. Let's say it's 100, 100, and 100. Then we add all these things together, and we get 300, right? 300 is neither 0 or 1. So you have to somehow squash your 300, your weighted input signal, into this range of fire or not fire. So with standard perception, we typically would use a step function. In other words, if you are above the threshold, this bias, then you output a one. If you are below the threshold, your output is zero. It's very discrete and a non-differentiable function. Now, because we are going from discrete to real, we want to uh, still use some kind of a squashing function, but we want it to be real valued. So again, bear with me some math. This is the sigmoid function. It's actually more popular all these days. These days we still mostly use these days we mostly use rectified linear units, and you can read up about those if you want. But I wanted to show you the sigmoids because, well, first of all, they still feature. Secondly, this is basically the, the exact translation of the step function into the real value domain. So there are two asymptotes. You either output something close to zero or output something close to one, and the input can be any real value, right? So this is technically a squashing function that takes your inputs of any magnitude, negative or positive, and then output something that can be in the middle, or it can be close to one or close to zero. So you basically force a particular binary-like range unit, which is obviously very useful if you are trying to do binary classification in the outputs, right? Of course, if you were doing regression, you probably just use a linear function instead of, um, instead of a squashing function. So if you want your line to actually do regression, don't add the squashing function, but if you're doing classification, squashing helps. Also, another important thing about squashing is um, it actually adds nonlinearity, but we'll get to that. And I'm still trying to speed run it, I swear. I'm going as fast as I can. Cool. So I already showed you how to train a single perceptron. Um, well, you can actually kind of use the same rule, I suppose, the perception tra training rule for a, an artificial neuron that is all real valued. But let's do a slightly kind of more, I guess, well-defined, uh, let, let, let me tell you how this is done mathematically. Again, I'll skip the math, I'll just give you the idea. Essentially, in supervised learning, we have outputs that we know to be correct. So we can ask our neuron to give us some outputs that it thinks are correct. We then do a comparison and we get some error. And if that error function is well-defined mathematically, if it is the differentiable function, we can then actually apply function minimization algorithms to figure out what values we should set to our weights. And this is the place where we typically derive back prop in class, but uh, unfortunately we don't have that kind of time. But yeah, the bottom line, the intuition is we want to minimize neurons error. 
So let's just go with the simplest example of some squared error. It's still that same difference between targets and outputs. This function's real value is differentiable. So we can actually go ahead and apply something standard that is a well-known thing in function optimization. Engineers will know all about it. Gradient descent, for example, is an, is an awesome choice. And the idea behind gradient descent is you have, if you have a differentiable function, right, you can, even if it's multidimensional, for every single um, variable, and in case of neural networks, the weights, let's go for just a single neuron. In case of a neuron, the weights are the variables that we are trying to optimize. We do not know what the weights should be. Weights are the only kind of components that we can actually modify. So we want to know, all right, how should I change these weights so that my error is as small as possible? So what we can do is we can calculate the gradient of the error. In other words, differentiate your error with respect to every single weight. And what, the, what hopefully you guys remember a bit of calculus, the derivative of a function gives you the slope of the function, right? And um, if you take the gradient, it takes you, gives you the slope for every single dimension. And it kind of points upwards. It's, it's, it, it points, it, well, when you just calculate the vector itself, it sort of points in the steepest direction of the steepest ascent. So if you follow that vector, you will kind of climb up the function. But in our case, we don't actually want to climb up. We want to climb down. And we really have the useful direction. So if we just put a minus in front of this vector that points upwards, it's going to point in the opposite direction, in the direction of the steepest descent. In other words, if we have the surface, right, we can obviously just go like along a mountain or we can go down the mountain. And the gradient basically tells you in, in which direction you should go to go down the mountain rather than up or along like the ridge of the mountain. It just gives you that direction and you can calculate this mathematically. And this is how we train neural networks. And changing this back to this formula I showed you easier earlier, the formulas that we get are remarkably similar. You still calculate the difference, you scale it by the inputs, and uh, that actually tells you whether you should dampen the weights or increase the weights. I know I'm skipping over technical details, but hopefully at least you get the gist. Okay, so most important limitation of perceptions and artificial neurons. They are great at solving cases like this. So just drawing linear boundaries between classes. This we can do. However, what if I gave you the following data set where the classes are completely mixed up? Can you draw the boundaries between them? Well, I think you can. You can maybe like do a little curve thing here, exclude this line, or maybe even do like a circle or something like that. Clearly, these are not linearly separable. We cannot separate these classes with hyperplanes. And that is a very well known. Okay, there is a hard limit to this function, to this, to this lecture. I guess this is where we end. Um, yeah, the so projector will come back, but we are out of time. So perhaps this is a good point to stop. The slides will be available. Um, Maybe just to let me quickly talk through kind of the last of it. So artificial neuron can model only a single hyperplane that is true. But the activation function that we add on top of it is actually nonlinear, right? We take this linear, li linear input uh, that we get and we squash it with some nonlinearity. It can be a sigmoid, it can be something else. But what, when the scientists have realized that perceptions are limited to linearly separable functions, they kind of gave up on perceptions for about 20 years. And then 20 years later, somebody thought, hey, but um, if we combine them together in successive layers, and if there is a, this nonlinear function between, then the combination of neurons can actually model any function that is not necessarily linear. So essentially, every single neuron forever is, is a hyperplane. But if you combine many in successive layers, you kind of can do this piecewise approximation of any function whatsoever. And the more neurons you have, the more piecewise components you have, and the more precise your estimation of the function will be. So I guess that's the long and short of neural networks. Um, maybe just a note on deep learning, since it's a deep learning in DABA. Again, once we've discovered that combining layers is useful, we've, uh, another a paper came out that said, well, actually, you can prove mathematically that a single hidden layer is sufficient to um, model any function, right? However, the problem with that is you don't really know how many neurons you need to model this arbitrary complexity. So, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I know we have to stop. All right, all right, cool. I'm doing it. I swear I'm going to stop. Sorry, I'm a lecturer. It's very hard to stop. Okay, so, um, yes, why is deep learning great? Because it actually breaks the problem down. As you go from layer to layer, you start with your raw data and just 
linking this back to the original concept, we basically systematically create information out of data. You take your pixels, for example, and you combine them into slightly more kind of groups of pixels, maybe like little edges. And then as you go from this layer to the next, you can say, right, if I put two, two edges together, I can make a little triangle. If I put two triangles together in a circle, that already looks like a cat. So basically, deep learning allows you to create hierarchical representations of data. And the best thing about neural nets is, yeah, they are universal function approximators. They can approximate any function in existence. I hope during the rest of the endeavor, you will see how amazing neural nets really are. I think, in my personal opinion, I might be slightly biased. They are the best machine learning method out there. Great. Thank you, everyone. Sorry for running over time. <laughs> Unfortunately, I cannot take questions. We have to run. Otherwise, we won't get oh, lunch. Ask me questions during lunch. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to everybody online. Thank you, Gabriel. You were awesome. Hopefully, next year, we'll, we'll see you in person. Great. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>